Another information, I'm not sure it's really useful because there is still room in, the, in, in this uh, place. But there is a, a screen in uh, a room number one uh, where you can uh, attend also the same conference. So actually, uh, Jose Antonio will split between the two rooms. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, José Antonio Carillo uh, from Imperial College in London, who will speak about uh, nonlinear aggregation diffusion equations. Okay. So um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation here to Rio. It's a pleasure to be here and to um, profit the weather from today. Okay, so um, as um, the title of my talk says, I would like to make a review about uh, different results. I've been um, working on uh, aggregation diffusion equations and more or less the, um, the uh, outline of the talk is the following. First, I would like to uh, set up a bit the problems and say some of the motivation that uh, took me to uh, discuss these, uh, these uh, kind of questions. And then uh, I have divided the talk in two different parts. In one part, I will discuss about uh, non-local uh, interactions between, uh, between uh, particles or individuals. You will see that in some of the models. And then I will discuss some uh, more recent uh, work in which I have introduced some, also some nonlinear diffusion and see how to uh, play the, uh, the balance between these uh, two effects. Okay, so let's go uh, uh, to... Uh, to first the, uh, the motivation. So let's start from a very basic uh, setting. Let's assume that we have just a system of uh, M particles that uh, they are interacting through a given uh, potential U. This potential U is, uh, I'm gonna assume is symmetric. Uh, for, uh, forget about this U zero that's A equals zero. I mean, you can define it as you want there like that. I mean, it will be typical of probably singular at zero and smooth outside uh, the origin, and um, then uh, if you assume that you have M particles interacting through that potential, you will, uh, uh, the first, uh, in the first order model, so I mean, uh, when you assume that uh, just the velocity is adjusted in instantaneously to the interaction between these uh, particles, you can write uh, this kind of uh, OD system for the evolution of these M particles, okay? So the question I want to discuss are uh, related to uh, the continuum model associated to this kind of, uh, of uh, particle systems. So at least uh, to guess what is the uh, equation for the uh, evolution of a particle density from uh, the particle system is quite easy. I mean, if you uh, denote by rho of Tx the density of particles at time t position x, then uh, just by the, in the way in which uh, you derive the velocity field here for the interaction between particles, you can guess that the uh, velocity field generated by that uh, continuum density of particles will be given by that formula, so by the convolution of the density with the gradient of the potential, okay? So then what you expect is uh, to have from this particle system in the continuous limit when the number of particles goes to infinity, an evolution equation of this form you will have a continuity equation for the evolution of the density and the velocity field computed in terms of the density by doing the convolution with the gradient of the potential. Okay, so just to, uh, to set up a bit uh, the, the, again the problem, so I will be discussing equations of that form, continuity equations where the velocity field is minus the gradient of the potential combined with rho and sometimes there will be an additional term that it will be uh, uh, my, uh, the gradient of uh, some pressure function, so it will be leading to a kind of nonlinear diffusion term. You can think about this gradient of the potential like the attracting repelling field generated by the particles. So some of the questions I want to discuss along my talk are the following. So the first one is for which uh, interaction potentials, which uh, typically they are gonna be uh, repulsive in the short range and attractive in the long range, do we have uh, convergence towards some non-trivial steady states? How can we characterize those uh, steady states and what are the uh, qualitative and stability properties of those steady states? 
And uh, if the repulsion is modeled by diffusion, uh, when does a balance between attraction and uh, diffusion happens? And what can I say about uh, uh, the balance? And uh, what can I say in those cases? Okay? So these are the three basic questions that I want to discuss along the talk. So some basic properties of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this model, of this equation. So this equation has a natural Lyapunov functional. And the natural Lyapunov functional for that equation is just composed of two terms, if you consider both uh, the attraction repulsion plus the diffusion. If you just uh, uh, think about the first part, it's just the total potential energy generated by the particles. And the second part will be like the internal energy, the term given by the, uh, the uh, I mean, the entropy, typically, if you are talking about uh, linear diffusion. Okay. Uh, those uh, equations have a very interesting structure that was uh, that uh, that uh, is very important to deduce some of the qualitative properties. Uh, they are uh, all of them gradient flows in some sense of that energy function. Uh, the Im important thing is that those equations have this uh, formal structure. You can write them as continuity equations where the velocity field is minus the gradient of the variation of the functional. That variation has to be thought as the variation respect to measures, so I mean measures that uh, or densities that have the same, the same mass. And due to that uh, generic structure of the equations, you have always a built-in dissipation, which is, uh, at least formally, you can compute the derivative in time of the uh, Lyapunov functional on solutions, and you get this, uh, this dissipation. Okay. So, uh, if you want to discuss uh, things about the stability properties of gradient flows, as you know, the first thing that you would like to do is to find some properties about the steady states, and then try to find what are the possible stable steady states. Typically, stable steady states for these systems, they will be at least local minimizers of these uh, functional over here, okay? So the first question that you want to uh, try to study or to analyze is the following minimization problem, okay? So you want to find the minimum of uh, that functional under certain assumptions on u and phi uh, in the set of densities or in the set of measures. I mentioned the set of measures because uh, typically when the blue term is not there, when the diffusion is not present, there is no any reason why your, the minimization of the uh, interaction energy will give you uh, well, uh, good functions, okay? So typically the, the problem, you have to set it in, in measures. While if you had a nonlinear diffusion, of course you expect this to uh, be in the set of at, at least in L1 densities. Okay, so now we can uh, uh, fix the, uh, a bit more the idea about this balance uh, between different forces by looking just at the minimization of this free energy and think uh, in terms of what uh, has to happen between the balance between attraction and repulsion parts of this potential to have some non-trivial steady state or if you had just an attractive potential, what is the balance between this attraction and this repulsion model by diffusion? Good. This is a, a very classical question, by the way, in many fields. So just uh, to name a few. Uh, the, uh, the first one that comes to my mind is in statistical mechanics when you are studying crystallization. But typically in that case, the potential is really very singular at zero. So we are talking about potentials like Leonard Jones. This is not the case in, uh, in most of the, uh, the things I'm going to discuss today. So typically my potential will be interval, at least, locally interval. So we are very far from this uh, crystallization business. But there is some connection I will mention later on. Then the second uh, example that comes easily is in semiconductors or in chemotaxis, which is very classical when you have a Newtonian potential. And uh, we'll come back to that in a few slides. And then there are other uh, more recent applications or that uh, they receive uh, more uh, attention from this community recently, like in infield games, in fractional diffusion, when uh, even the interaction potential is a bit more singular than Newtonian. And recently I learned that, uh, at least in the case of the interaction potential, this problem appears naturally for the eigenvalue distribution in random matrices. 
So, I mean, this kind of question appears in many, many different, different fields. But I'm going to tell you why I came to that question. So, another motivation, which is in this collective behavior model that I started to work some years ago. And it's a bit related to, uh, the motivation is a bit related to the talk of Sunjul Ha yesterday, in fact. So, let me just quickly uh, show you this uh, slide, because this is very, very, very classical, but I had to uh, show it. One of the typical examples, as I said before, is the chemotaxis problem, okay? So what you have is uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, typical Keller-Siegel model, where the, you may have a, a kind of nonlinear diffusion, and uh, yes, uh, what, uh, as you know, what you want to model is this kind of uh, collective behavior of a, a large number of cells that they are following some uh, presence of a chemotractant. So you can play that game that they are playing uh, with the pipette, putting this kind of a chemotractant, and then you see what you want to model, okay? But uh, uh, in uh, the macroscopic limit of that kind of uh, experiment, one of the typical examples or the typical uh, system that you get is this kind of reaction diffusion system. And uh, when you take out the uh, blue term, you have the typical, uh, uh, or the more classical parabolic elliptic uh, Keller-Siegel model, okay? So this is uh, one of the most classical samples of, uh, of this uh, uh, collective behavior business. But uh, let me uh, mention another one which is more related to uh, the talk as I mentioned yesterday, of Sun Yul Ha, in which uh, you want to model this, uh, um, uh, this the so-called swarming of uh, animals, uh, uh, which is this uh, aggregation of agents of similar size and body type that uh, move in some coherent way. And this is something that has been reported in many, many different species of animals. Uh, let me just uh, go to the point that relates to this, uh, to this uh, talk. Typically, this, uh, there are plenty of uh, models in this uh, collective behavior uh, community, and most of them they are based on what they call individual-based models, which are like particle models from our viewpoint, and uh, typically they take into account three different mechanisms, attraction, repulsion, and alignment. So it depends on the models how you do each of the, the modeling of each of these effects, you obtain different behaviors, but uh, mainly uh, uh, you can uh, say that uh, the uh, long range attraction that you want to be social with others and the inner repulsion that you have, you want to have some small area by yourself, you can model it, or many people are modeling by using this kind of interaction potentials. So, in fact, one of the basic models in that direction was introduced by the UCLA uh, um, group around uh, Maria Rita Dorsoni, Andrea Bertozzi, Lincoln Chase, and others. And one of the basic uh, models that they were uh, studying is this kind of second order Newton-like equations in which you see that you have this attraction repulsion effect modeled by just uh, these pairwise uh, um, uh, forces. And uh, for them, the typical potential is something of that form. Decreasing as a function of the radius means for me that is repulsive and increasing is attractive. So they have a typical uh, length scale for uh, particles to, uh, to uh, range. And uh, you can uh, cook up potentials like that very easily with, for instance, uh, exponential decaying functions of the radius. And uh, apart from that, they have this additional term that fixes the asymptotic uh, speed of the particles. Okay, so the important thing in my talk is in fact to show you that such a simple model, if you take uh, a large number of particles, they can lead to different patterns. And the two of the patterns that they see are, or you see easily, are the so-called flock pattern and the mill pattern. So the flock means that essentially in that second order model, uh, all particles, they arrange into some uh, particular, in some positions, some kind of crystal-like position, and then they move into some particular direction. So they all arrange and moving in this direction. In all these movies, the center of uh, mass is taken away, such a way that you have a center window, okay? So this is just moving translationally in this direction. While here, uh, after a while, we will see that uh, the particles arrange in such a way that they rotate around certain uh, location in a uh, compact uh, kind of form. 
you see that uh, it seems quite chaotic, but at some point they will arrange and uh, yeah, you almost have it. And then you have this kind of quite a stable uh, mill formation. Okay, so the question is uh, um, here, how can you describe the formation of those patterns, these particular uh, solutions? So in fact, the connection to my talk today is rather about uh, the flux mainly. So if you come back here, the flux, this means that the particles are arranged in certain positions, they move translationally. This means if we go back to this, uh, to this uh, particle system, that all of them, they are moving to this velocity, so this term is zero. And then the positions the are such that the interparticle distances verify that uh, the sum of forces is zero. So in fact, what we are seeing, the shape in position of those particles is just a steady state for the uh, uh, first order model, or if you want, is a, a minimum of the free energy with m particles, okay? So the shape in the space of the flux is precisely related to the uh, steady state of the uh, first order model. For the mill, you can do something similar. It's not exactly the same energy, but for a different energy, as you can relate it to a first order model too. Okay, so now that we have seen the motivation, and we had fun for 15, 20 minutes with this, so now let's see what I can say about the uh, qualitative properties of the minimizers of that uh, function. And we continue to have some fun. Here I'm going to show you some simulations about the first of the model. The first uh, system I showed you in the first slide. So we had these n particles interacting between the, each other with the gradient of a potential, and I'm just following in time the first order model, the gradient flow for particles. Okay, I'm not telling you which potential I'm using. I will, I will do that very soon, okay? So this is a bit less rich in the dynamics than the uh, second order model because it's just a, a gradient flow, so you just go uh, to the minimum of the, of the energy. But nevertheless, it's quite interesting already you do the first uh, simulations with very simple potentials, as you will see. And then in this case, you see that there was this fast tendency of the particles to go to a certain radius. And then all of a the sudden, they were not happy. And then they were rearranging into certain locations and then aggregating into four points in that case. While here, they went to the, uh, to the circle. They move a little bit, but when they were happy and they stay there, uniformly distributed, if you want. Okay, so here you have something similar is gonna happen there. So you have this fast tendency to go to the circle, but then all of a the sudden, they are not happy again. And the in, in, uh, instability that is triggered now is a kind of shape instability. Then it becomes a bit more triangular, and then the particles are, uh, go around, and then they aggregate onto this, uh, in this case, uh, three pieces of curves. While in the last case, yeah, well, particles, they go and they arrange somehow in um, more or less uniformly in that kind of uh, seems annular region. Uh, you can have a lot of fun by using different potentials. And then uh, uh, you can have uh, different shapes like this one in which uh, the particles now they are going to arrange into different uh, connected components and uh, kind of uh, tri triangular soccer ball. I shouldn't talk about soccer, sorry. So, uh, so the, in the next uh, slide, I'm just showing the, the particle potential um, that uh, I was using. So I was using a combination of two powers. And uh, so it, it was essentially the, the easiest possible choice for the potential to have an attractive repulsive potential and radial, so I'm just doing a combination of two powers, A larger than B, and I'm dividing by A and B because A and B could be negative depending on the dimension, and then in this way I keep attraction and repulsion as what it is. And B, the most repulsive it can be, I'm gonna assume that it's larger or equal than Newtonian. It could be larger or equal than minus dimension. This is not, uh, but not less than that because it's local integrability. Anyhow, what we see, what, we, uh, what I did is just to fix the attraction and then decrease B. 
decreasing B is to increase the repulsion, okay? So I'm getting a, a stronger and stronger repulsion, and if I am with a value of B larger than two, which means that the potential at zero is at least uh, uh, C2 smooth, then we have this uh, convergence uh, towards points. Well, if B is a bit smaller, then I see this uniform distribution on the circle, B getting smaller and smaller, so repulsion larger and larger, I see that this uh, circle is, uh, is uh, I mean, it fattens a bit, it thickens, and then it produces this kind of unwrapped region. At some point, you see the full ball, okay? So now that we, uh, so the intuition is clear that if the repulsion is stronger and stronger, so the effect is that the particles spread more and more. So can we prove such a thing? So let's see. Okay, the first comment I do, just because of some of the uh, pictures, uh, I mean, some of the simulations I show you, is that there, there are plenty of stationary states. It's not that there, there is one, and uh, that one is the, the, the one chosen by the evolutions. Always you can prove that for this kind of potentials, a uniform distribution on the circle is always a steady state. Sometimes it's stable, sometimes it's not. And that's why we saw some of these instabilities related to the uniform distribution on the circle. Uh, this picture tries to prove this uh, fact that the uniform distribution on the circle is a steady state. I will not explain it to you, but this is just a balance on forces, and it's very simple to, to show just based on the symmetry. So just this is uh, just a, a, a disclaimer that, uh, I mean, we, will, we can have uh, plenty of stationary solutions. We don't know how many we have, in fact. But uh, for sure, sometimes at some of them, they, they are not stable, and then we see something different. Of course, uh, you could say, I mean, uh, uh, what if uh, uh, we, I was showing you uh, some simulations doing uh, particles? I can also uh, simulate, I mean, we can simulate uh, what happens with the continuous model, with the uh, PDE. And uh, this is the case of uh, the mill pattern, so there is a, uh, an additional term in the equation, an additional external potential, but it doesn't really matter to show the, 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 the behavior that you see this concentration on the density in, a, in this case, an annular region with a uh, uh, jump at the boundary in that particular case. So, okay, so in that case, it's not uh, concentrated onto something uh, which is too singular, but a kind of, uh, of um, discontinuous solution. Okay, good. You can uh, check that uh, also in more dimensions if you want, and uh, just uh, do the same trick, take a power law combination, and then uh, take B smaller and smaller, then check what happens with, uh, with the, uh, sorry, with the uh, uh, minimizer that you get by the gradient flow, and you see that uh, the same thing happens again. If you fix A or play with A and decrease B, which is the important thing, then the support of the minimizer gets larger and larger. Okay, so the question is, can we prove um, uh, this qualitative uh, uh, property for the solutions? So that's the first uh, uh, result I'm gonna discuss, in fact. So in order to explain the result, I need to introduce some technical tool because I need to deal, in this case, with measures. Remember that in this part, I don't have the diffusion term. As I said, I only have the interaction potential. So I, 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 we see in the simulations that we might uh, have concentration onto uh, points or onto uh, curves. So I had to deal with measures. And then I had to deal with some kind of notion of distance between measures to say that uh, measures are close or not and talk about local minimizers. So the uh, topology that we used is in fact related to some uh, transport uh, uh, distances between measures. And the one that we use, and we, uh, it was useful for our purposes, is the so-called Wasserstein infinity distance. I'm gonna try to tell you what it is in a nutshell. So let me see if I succeed. Imagine that you have two completely supported measures. So you are taking all the possibilities of sending one measure to the other. This means the transference plans. So you are sending mass from each location with one measure to the other. And then you compute the maximal displacement that you have in this transference plan. So this is your, your cost, is the maximal displacement. So you just uh, 
measure the distances uh, that uh, you send mass from one location to another, the maximal displacement gives you the cost. If, it's company, if both are company supported, this is perfectly well-defined uh, uh, um, quantity. And now you take the optimal one. So you take over all the possibilities of sending one measure to the other, you take the optimal one means taking the if. So this is the, the object. Why this complicated object is useful for us? In fact, there is a very simple comment that may uh, shed some, may, may give you some light on it, which is the fact that it is the closer to doing linearization around equilibrium dynamical systems. So if I wanted to check these, uh, somehow these, uh, these uh, shapes that I get by particle systems, I would like to linearize around one equilibrium of this M particle system. I would like to send then the particles not too far away to be able to do some kind of linearization. So precisely in W infinity, sending a little bit of mass nearby is a small perturbation, but sending an epsilon of mass to the moon is not a small perturbation. It's a large perturbation in W infinity. While in other, measure, in other distances like W2, that's a big perturbation. So that's why W infinity is useful for us. On the other hand, you have a, a more pragmatic answer to this, which is that is in fact the coarser topology among all transport distances. So whatever I say for local minimizers in W infinity, I will say that also for local minimizers in W2, because you have this simple relation. Okay, so now let's, um, let's uh, fix uh, some hypothesis on the potential. Let's be more precise. So I'm going to assume that the potential is bounded from below and lower semi-continuous and locally interval. Under that, uh, under that assumption, in fact, we can get the following kind of Euler-Lagrange condition in this very weak setting of uh, measures with the distance W infinity. So let me explain you this result. If I have a local minimizer in W infinity of the interaction potential, then I have an information on the potential generated by the local mean. So I take u both with mu, call it psi, and then for psi, what I can say is that psi of x is larger or equal than psi of x naught for at any point of uh, the support of mu. So in other words, that any point in the support of mu, or the local mean, is a local minimum of that potential function in that sense, in the almost everywhere sense. So uh, just know that the epsilon is uniform in the support of mu. This is important for certain things. And let me tell you, just to make the comparison to the euler lagrange conditions in W2, in, uh, if, you try, if you do the same uh, um, computations, uh, doing perturbations in the W2 uh, distance, which I didn't introduce, but uh, believe me, is something related to these transport metrics, then you, you can get a bit more information. You can say that, in fact, the uh, potential function is constant on the support of mu, and um, so that's why you have the u combo with mu is uh, that constant, mu almost everywhere, and also you have the condition that psi of x is larger or equal than that constant outside the support. So the question is, in fact, uh, uh, the uh, main uh, question to uh, uh, relate to the support of mu, in fact, is related also to the regularity of this potential psi. You can see it uh, both ways. OK, so let's see. I mean, this is just to give you an idea of the kind of euler lagrange conditions that you get in this very weak setting of minimization. And with this, what we were able to show is the following uh, result. I want to make uh, the emphasis only in this case, where the uh, repulsion strength, say, is between uh, two and two minus dimension. So here, the assumptions I'm doing is that uh, the potential behaves like a power law near the origin. I'm not uh, assuming that this is a power law, just that this uh, behaves like a power law near the origin and that the uh, repulsion is between, that, uh, uh, between two and two minus dimension. So if you have a local minimizer of the interaction energy in that sense, in the W infinity sense, what I can tell you is that all connected components in the support, 
they have Hausdorff dimension larger than two minus b. So this gives you a bound from below on the support of the, uh, of the connected components, on the uh, dimension of the support of the connected components, as you see that it's increasing when the repulsion gets stronger and stronger, and it goes to a full dimension exactly at the Newtonian. It should be a larger or equal, by the way. Okay, so that's the result that we got uh, uh, recently. And uh, the ideas are based, uh, the strategy that will not show you, but uh, are pure, purely variational in this case. We use the Euler Lagrange condition in W infinity, and uh, we uh, use that to prove by contradiction that we can build better competitors if this is not satisfied. And uh, this is also used uh, together uh, with uh, some suitable second order uh, conditions. Uh, and at the end, we uh, make use of some geometric measure theory that uh, relates uh, the result uh, from uh, the minimization to capacities of measures. Okay, so just to tell you that uh, the, uh, the structure of those uh, steady states or the possible stable steady states is, uh, I mean, the, the dimension of the support is related to repulsion, and uh, this is, uh, uh, um, this is uh, the, the actual result that we have now. Uh, we cannot uh, really uh, see this uh, actual jump that we saw on the, on the dimension from the simulations, but uh, okay. So right now, uh, until now, I have just uh, given you some qualitative properties about local means. But I didn't tell you anything about the systems, if any, of a global minimizer of the function. So is there a global minimizer of the function? Because uh, maybe, um, so under which conditions do I have uh, uh, this uh, global mean for the uh, interaction energy? So I'm gonna t uh, give you some conditions for that. And this is uh, also a very recent result. So I try to explain the result first in terms of uh, uh, energy. So I'm gonna uh, call that the potential is non-H stable when the energy at infinity costs more than near the origin. What do I mean by this? So for me, non-H stable means that there is exist some measure for which, completely supported, for which the energy is less than some value, say zero, and that the potential at infinity has a larger value than that, say zero. Zero here doesn't play any role. You can substitute zero by one million, okay? It's just a, to fix some value for the potential. So I'm just saying that the, the infimum of the energy should be negative and that the potential at infinity has to be larger or equal than zero. So under those simple conditions plus the uh, basic conditions on you I mentioned before, local integrability and lower semi-continuity, then you can show that uh, the interaction uh, poten uh, potential energy has a global minimizer and moreover, we can show that the, those global minimizer uh, have uh, compact support. So in fact we have a, uh, let's say, constructive way of uh, proving that uh, you have a global minimizer that gives us also a bound on the uh, support of the uh, minimizer. I should have said probably from the very beginning that uh, the problem has uh, translational invariance, so I'm just fixing, if you want, uh, I'm talking about global minimizers and uh, we, uh, by also fixing, let's say, the center of mass. Okay, so this is um, a very recent uh, result with a PhD student of mine, Patakini and Jose Alfredo Canizo, where we use these uh, euler lagrange conditions in W2 that I showed you before to, uh, to show, in fact, a uniform repartition of the mass over the support. In fact, this is very much connected to uh, Lyon's concentration compactness principle. And uh, very recently, in fact, there have been a, another uh, a group of people that they were using a variation based on, uh, on these ideas to prove the system of the global minimizer. But they don't, uh, in, uh, they don't get the compact support uh, for, the, for the global minimizer. So in some sense, our approach is just, in that case, constructive and give us this additional information. Okay, so just to summarize, 
in some particular cases. So for the power law, no matter which combination of the powers, A larger than B, larger than minus dimension, or for the Morse potential, that was the other example that appeared in the simulations at the beginning, with the conditions, uh, some conditions on the length and the uh, strengths, that were the conditions that were used by Andrea Bertozzi and the group at uh, UCLA just for the simulations. They found them by simulating and describing the typical uh, behaviors. Precisely in that range is where those conditions are met, and then you have global minimizers for the interaction energy in all these cases. So uh, at least uh, we have also a good, um, a good information on the, uh, on the global minimizers in that case. Good. A final comment in this direction. Um, you can uh, uh, play also, uh, I mean, uh, ask yourself, what can you say about uh, the regularity of the local minimizer? Let's say close to the Newtonian case, for instance. In, part in the particular case of the Newtonian, you can do that very, uh, uh, be I mean, very in very detail. So if the repulsive part of the interaction energy is the Newtonian, in fact, you can prove that all the local minimizers are L-infinity compactly supported densities. So you can take advantage of the re uh, very uh, strong repulsion to prove even uh, the regularity. And again, the connect the, this is, uh, is uh, done by using the euler lagrange conditions. And the main idea there was to connect it to obstacle problems in elliptic, uh, uh, in, uh, in variational inequalities. So you can uh, take advantage of that connection that we recently found with uh, Matthias Delgadino and Tuan Mele in the case of the interaction potentials to uh, get that regularity. And in fact, that works also for more singular potentials. Okay, so all of that about the, uh, um, info, uh, about the uh, let's say, a stationary, a stationary case. But uh, let me, t uh, let me uh, tell you uh, what we know a little bit about uh, the evolution problem. In fact, for the evolution problem, uh, we know much less, and I explained you a little bit why. Um, as I said in my first slide, the aggregation equation, you can uh, see it as the uh, uh, mean field limit of the, uh, this uh, uh, first order particle system, okay? As usual, the way of uh, looking up, um, the more rigorous way of talking about the uh, mean field limit would be associated to the first particle system, uh, first order particle system, you define the empirical measure, with this uh, sum of Dirac's, and then what you expect is that if you approximate the initial data in some way, then that the solutions at time t, the empirical measure at time t, will approach the density at time t, uh, being the solution of the aggregation equation. So that's the natural question about the mean field limit. So uh, can you do that in this case with these uh, singular potentials? So the answer is uh, yes, and in fact, uh, you can use uh, also this uh, W infinity as an ingredient. And let me just, uh, I think uh, here I just want to make uh, the emphasis on, uh, well, you have uh, certain quantities that you have to control, the distance between the empirical measure and the solution of the PDE, and the interparticle uh, distance to avoid that there are collisions in uh, finite time. And let me just tell you that uh, if you have uh, certain conditions on the potential, so some singular potential with some strength, uh, then mm, the first uh, comment I want to make is that you have a well posedness theory in certain, uh, in certain functional setting for the aggregation equation. So the functional setting is sun L1 LP with a suitable P related to the singularity here. This is not too important to get into details, just that you have this uh, L1 LP well posedness setting for the aggregation equation. And then the result that you can get uh, by uh, working uh, very similarly to what you do in fluid mechanics for the alpha Euler equation is this kind of well-prepared initial data uh, result. So you have some uh, particles 
that approach my initial density. And such that they verify some additional assumption of a good repartition uh, initially, then you can prove the mean field limit. Uh, forget about the details of the, of the, uh, of the technical details of the uh, uh, result. The only important thing I want to make emphasis is this L1, LP. Why I'm saying that? Because for the uh, case of the singular potentials that we have, typically the steady states, the steady states, typically they are not in that class. So this mean field limit is uh, result is nice, but it's not uh, the, 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 the most interesting thing if you want to get local, I mean global in time asymptotics uh, for uh, those problems. So convergence towards the steady states for those problems. Because, as I said, the, um, the steady states, they are not in the class L1, LP. Let me just uh, make a summary of the things that I did in this part. Uh, so I show you that the dim dimensionality of the support local minimizers can be classified in terms of the repulsion strength. And I show you that if the strength of the repulsion is stronger and or done or equal to Newtonian, in fact, you have uh, very good uh, uh, steady states. The company supported global minimizers assist under reasonable conditions. And uh, some open problems from my viewpoint here is that uh, you saw this breaking of symmetry that happens in many cases for the, 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 the simulations with particles. We don't know how to uh, catch that uh, from the variation of viewpoint, and I think it's quite interesting. And the comment I just made about the evolution, for uh, the stable steady states, are not genetically in the class L1, LP, in which uh, we are able to show this mean field limit. So, in fact, uh, it would be nice to find a, a right functional setting in which we could uh, prove the convergence towards the uh, some local minimizer as t goes to infinity for the Gibbs gradient flow. But still, since precisely those st uh, stable state state, they are not in that class, still we don't know how to make it uh, work, only in particular cases like the Newtonian case. Okay, so these are the, more or less the references related to, uh, to this, um, this part. And uh, in the last five minutes, I think I have, or something like that, seven, I would like to, um, to uh, make uh, a couple of comments about the uh, uh, balance with uh, nonlinear diffusion. So, so now let's assume that we keep, a, again, this attraction potential, but the repulsion, instead of modeling by the an interaction potential, we model it by a diffusion. So the typical uh, case that comes to my mind will be something like that. And in fact, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna discuss is just uh, this particular case, very briefly. And if anybody has any questions, we can discuss uh, long uh, after that. So let's assume that we have some homogeneous uh, nonlinear diffusion, so like porous medium like, okay, the plasma of rho to the m, and some attraction given by a power law. Okay, so purely homogeneous. So in fact, it's not difficult to check by scaling considerations that you may expect three different regimes. A regime in which the diffusion dominates is when m is larger than that value, okay? And as I said, this comes from scalings of uh, simple scalings by dilations, either on the free energy or on the PDE itself. So you can check that uh, if m is larger than that uh, value, d minus a over d, then you may expect this term to dominate. So the diffusion should uh, somehow win. And uh, maybe you have some non-trivial stationary states again. Then, uh, if m is less than, that, less than that value, typically you are uh, in a situation in which you have some kind of criti critical threshold uh, problem, where you have some conditions in which you have blow up in finite time, and some conditions in which you have global assistance. Some particular cases of those uh, two regimes has been done. The typical cases related to the Keller serial, for instance. So just take a equals uh, d minus two. Okay, 
2 minus d. No, d minus 2. 2 minus d. Uh, and uh, the final uh, case is when m is exactly d minus a over d, which is the case in which you have a kind of fair competition between nonlinear diffusion and aggregation. In that case, you may expect to have a critical quantity. In the Keller-Siegel, is the mass, and uh, typically in that case, it's always uh, the mass. And uh, you can check that there is a critical mass in which you separate the diffusive behavior from the blow-up behavior. So there are cases that have been treated here, uh, in uh, particular cases of this in the literature. There are plenty of literature that I'm not quoting here. Sorry for that. That was not the point. And I want just to concentrate, in fact, in the diffusion dominated regime, because surprisingly, in the literature, not too many people pay attention to this case. And particularly, I'm just going to show you one par very particular case, which is the corresponding to the classical Keller-Siegel model, where uh, in two dimensions. So here is A is zero, essentially, is the log. And then M larger than one. So just put A equals zero, you get in two dimensions then M lar larger than one. So that case. That would be the typical diffusion-dominated case for the classical Keller-Siegel in 2D. So with uh, Van San Calve, we proved some years ago that uh, you have global existence of solutions and that they are bounded uh, in time uniformly. So we have, uh, with this, we have, if you want, another way of regularizing the Keller-Siegel, uh, classical Keller-Siegel after blow-up. But the question that uh, remain open is, what about the long-time asymptotics? So in fact, if you do some numerics, uh, you can easily uh, check that in those cases, what you expect is convergence towards a company supported steady state. OK? And there was nothing about uh, the system of company supported steady state of this problem, so we got interested into that recently. So this is uh, the simulation with different parameters, M and A, but uh, that you see, you, you check this, that it should be true in the whole uh, diffusion-dominated regime, in fact. So the question that we uh, uh, wanted to discuss, again, it was related to the global minimizers in that particular case. So you have uh, now the nonlinear diffusion term, M larger than one, logarithmic interaction, attractive. Do we have a global minimizer of this function? And uh, the interesting thing is that this functional, in principle, uh, doesn't lie directly into, uh, uh, into the set of functions which you can apply classical tools, like, again, Leon's concentration compactness principle. But uh, uh, the, uh, the, the developments, uh, the late developments uh, using the log HLS inequality for the Keller-Siegel model, in fact, led us to a nice idea how to uh, control here uh, the different terms. In fact, uh, I think uh, I don't have too much time left, so I'm going to skip uh, a couple of uh, comments. And I think uh, the most interesting thing to say is that some of the steps in the idea of proving uh, global minimizers of uh, this function. So you can prove more or less easily that global minimizer must be radial. This uses uh, the fact that uh, Carlin and Laws proof that the, with the logarithmic interaction, you will uh, go down by doing uh, uh, decrease, uh, radially decreasing rearrangements. Then you use, again, the log HLS inequality to be able to get a bound from below. And not only a bound from below, it, will, it helps you to get a control in each of the two terms, integral of rho to the m and integral of the positive part of log rho x rho y. So that is the one that, in fact, we used to get some confinement of mass that was the missing point to get the, the compactness of um, minimizing sequences. So we used the logarithmic part of the uh, interaction potential, the positive part of the log, to get a control of the log moment of the minimizing sequences. And then we have a control of the confinement of mass. So with this, you have. Uh, uh, the system of global minimizers. And then, really, you can prove after that by uh, more classical tools that those global minimizers are, in fact, regular in their support, compactly supported, everything that you expect for it. I think the, uh, 
the main, uh, the main difficulty was at the level of finding the right way of proving the system of uh, company supported uh, uh, global minimizers. So let me just conclude uh, uh, in this part. I think it's uh, interesting to have identified these uh, different regimes, at least for homogeneous kernels. And I think still there are some work to do to clarify many, many, uh, many things about these uh, divisions. And especially I was uh, uh, surprised about the diffusion dominated case, at least in the case of the log. With powers, you could use uh, uh, classical tools, in fact. And still for the long time asymptotics, it's not so clear for the evolution problem, precisely because of this lack of confinement. From where you get the confinement of mass? to pass to the limit as t goes to infinity. That's uh, the point that uh, remains to be proven. Thank you very much. Discussion is open. Who asked the first question? Yes. Yeah, I put the, the, the emphasis on, uh, yeah, sorry. But yeah. Uh, uh, your estimates are not uniform in time, so. Sure. Yeah, no, 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 there, there is no any problem with that. I'm just saying that it would be very nice to find a uh, well posedness theory that includes my steady states. Because in this way I could get a result of a convergence towards a steady state for the gradient, using the gradient flow information. I have a dissipation. Typically, you have a gradient flow. You will, at least, you should be able to show that as t goes to infinity, you converge towards the set of the steady states. But you see, the, the evolution for the evolution problem, I have just a theory in L1 LP, and the steady states, the, minimization, the minimizers, I know that they are not there in many cases. So there is a mismatch there that uh, one has to find a way. That's, uh, that was the point. In L1 LP? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 we don't have. This is the point. I mean, the, no, 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 only in L1 LP. Um, in the beginning, you made a distinction between uh, the two topologies uh, related to the W infinity and W2 uh, distance. Uh, that makes sense only when you are interested in uh, local minimizers, but if you are interested in global minimizers, I think that it exactly. does not matter. Yeah. Exactly, it doesn't matter at all. That's mm -hmm. why in the W, uh, sorry, in the part of global minimizers, I was using the euler Lagrange conditions in uh, W2, which are, um, I mean, it, it, they uh, quantify this, uh, the constant in each uh, possible connected component of the support of the minimizer. Yes, certainly. Another question? Uh, if not, let's thank the speaker again.